Hello, welcome to Caesar Snack Sandwich. Today I took a quick look at Uniswap's version 3 white paper. Now I have read this in full. Um, I'm basing this entire video on my understanding of this. There is a few questions that I have kind of left off that are not really covered completely in here or I just didn't find them or I, you know, I didn't uh, visualize that idea. But anyways, uh, I'm going to go through a flowchart and kind of explain the understanding I have of this and then uh, you can kind of go from there and dig deeper and try to find out what you can understand further beyond what I what I'm talking about here. Now I will preface this with this this white paper is pretty short. It's actually quite a bit quite a lot shorter than even like a documentation that I would normally read and make a video. But there are some pretty damn cool ideas in here, so I figure it's worth making a video and showing you. And it's definitely innovative and new, and there are definitely some cool ideas in here. So let's swing over to the flowchart, and I'll start my explanation there. If you would like to support the channel, I would suggest you to check out the secret sandwich.xyz. It's the secret sandwich NFT project. You can come here, you can mint an NFT, or you can come and check out your NFTs. Okay, so let's get back to it. Okay, so here we are on the flowchart, and we are going to start our explanation here with Dev Dan. Okay, I'm using Dev Dan here instead of Dollar Bill because it's kind of a sophisticated position. Uh, in order to use this uh, Uniswap version 4 as a, a protocol, you're going to have to be a little bit more sophisticated than just someone who understands finances or something like that. So you need you definitely need devs in order to utilize it. Uh, the features that it, it it offers. Well, not all of them, but most of them. Okay, so here we have a uh, Dev Dan, okay, or Danny Dev, and he's got uh, let's say two tokens. He's got Caesar token and ETH, and he wants to create an LP on uh, Uniswap. Now, um, before we can understand Uniswap version four, we kind of kind of understand Uniswap version three. So I just want to do a quick little reminder or primer on that and uh, just kind of use that as a basis to explain what, what the, the changes are to Uniswap version 4. Okay, so let's say he wants to make a, an LP on version 3, the concentrated liquidity pools. So he would, first thing he would have to do is he would have to convert his ETH to WETH. Now this is usually done in the, inside the transaction, but that action does happen. So he converts ETH into WETH or WETH, right? He deposits both of them, and then uh, Uniswap contracts the factory in the contract will initially initiate a new pool. So it deploy a new contract with these two pool tokens inside. Okay, so I'm calling it an initiate or init, and, but you have to keep in mind that this is a gas transaction of deploying a, an LP. That's why it's so expensive to create a new LP. You need to actually deploy a contract to the blockchain. Okay, so then they... So then he has, there's a contract out there that understands the uh, the prices of uh, Caesar versus ETH and that, you know, th that this contract can then keep track of that and then people can add liquidity to and from this contract, okay? Now, when he actually does add the tokens, when his tokens are actually added in there, then he has minted an NFT and that NFT will sit in his wallet and signify his his share of this uh, pool of tokens assuming that there are more than one person in there at first of course it's just him but as people come and go or add add liquidity to it then there will be more and more nfts out there now this is one of the questions i don't know about version 4 it doesn't say specifically or explicitly that there will be the minting of nfts but i assume that they're still going to be using these nfts for uh for everyone who's using uniswap version 4 so you'll still probably have nft positions okay now, another thing to keep in mind that this is concentrated liquidity. So I'm going to, this is a very like low level summary of what concentrated liquidity is, just so you can kind of understand what's going on here. So when he sets up his pool, he decides his tokens, uh, how he wants to allocate them versus each other. So let's say uh, uh, Danny Dev here, he takes and he puts his, his tokens into this pool. He's the first one there, so he can... He doesn't have any kind of set price at the start, but he says, oh, I want one Caesar ETH, one Caesar to equal one ETH at most, right? And I want my money to be one Caesar is equal to 0 0.5 ETH at most. And let's say the price is at 0 0.75, somewhere in the middle, right? So the current price is around that, okay? So he puts his tokens in here and uh, he sets these ranges that he's acceptable. Now, if the price goes above this, then he's going to be basically selling out all his Caesar tokens and he will have ETH. So if he put in 100 Caesar tokens 
and the price goes above 1.1 ETH, then he will have 100 ETH in his in his in his position waiting. If it goes back down inside, then it will adjust accordingly, and then the same out the bottom. Okay, so the same is just the same as at the bottom. So you, these ranges are very important, but what they do is they allow for. Uh, more efficiency of trading within this range okay so then his money is used more actively when the trading happens within this range but once it goes outside this range then he's all in one token okay so that's the important thing to remember about version 3 concentrated liquidity now this is not new stuff so I don't want to really hammer that too much but that's an idea you have to kind of understand this okay because it's still going to be here okay now along comes a boosted bill and he wants to trade through this version 3 pool position. So he's got some ETH, right? So what does he have to do? Uh, if he wants to buy some Caesar tokens, the first thing he needs to do is he converts his ETH to ETH. The ETH goes into the pool and the Caesar token comes out. The fees are set aside in another contract for uh, a Danny Dev to to um, and all the other liquidity pool holders to claim later. Okay, so this is how Uniswap version 3 works. Uh, for for the for the most part, okay. Now, the first change is that uh, they're going to use native ETH, or they're going to allow the use of native ETH. So, what does this do? Is it cuts out these two major gas costs. So, this is like switching from ETH to WETH costs to gas. Transferring WETH costs more gas than transferring ETH. So, by allowing these pools to use ETH instead of WETH if they want. It doesn't exclude WETH from the, the, the choices, but it allows for the use of ETH. It reduces the gas fees quite a bit. So it reduces the need, because most people sit in their wallet in ETH because they need that to pay gas, so they just hold ETH. And when they want to buy something, they're, they're, <clears throat> they're paying to convert it, and then they're paying more to transfer WETH than they would if they just sent ETH in there, okay? So that's the, the first key benefit of, of this system, okay? Now the second thing is, let's say Boosted Bill here, he doesn't have ETH, or he, he's, got, he's got to have some ETH, but let's say he doesn't want to spend his ETH on Caesar, he wants to convert his shitcoin into Caesar. So what does it do? Is he takes the shitcoin and he sends it into the shitcoin pool, which is a different contract. That contract says, oh, we need to give some ETH to this contract through the router, right? And then this contract says, oh, we need to give Caesar tokens to, to this address, the address, the initiating address, or the, the source of this shitcoin, right? <clears throat> now, what uh, Uniswap version 4 does is it fixes this a little bit to, to decrease the cost of, of, of gas yet again, okay? So instead of having these two separate initiated deployed contracts, it has one deployed contract, okay? So it reduces the gas of, you know, boosted uh, bill here, needing, or sorry, so not boosted bill, uh, uh, it, Danny Dev having to initiate a new pool because there's already a contract here just waiting for tokens to be put inside. He doesn't need to mint or deploy a new contract every time there's a pool made. They just add to the contract that's already there. So that gas cost has been reduced, right? And then also with multi-hops, this is called a multi-hop. So hop, 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 right? <clears throat> so this multi-hop swaps is also heavily reduced because the, the, the token doesn't need to go from this wallet to this contract address, then this from this contract address to this contract address, and then from this contract address to this contract address. So it basically cuts out this 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 extra contract address transfer here. Okay, and we'll see it a little bit more when we talk about the next one, which is called the next improvement, which is kind of hand in hand with the singleton is the flash accounting. So. Uh, so they instead of having all of these transfer, 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 because like in, in the old system, you would have a transfer, a transfer, and a transfer. So all of these contracts would need to call the transfer function to transfer their tokens from them or transfer from, right? So transfer from them to the other contract or some, some, something like that. So there's usually the router is going to transfer from here, transfer from here, transfer from here. But since it's all in a singleton, then they can just do the math in the memory and then write the result inside this single contract. So it doesn't need to do this hop, okay? It's just, so it reduces the amount of transfers needed for the swaps. 
Now, if you come over here and you do see there are some transfers here. So there's a transfer in of ETH, there's a transfer in of Caesar, and then there's also this minting. So this again, I don't know if this, this transfer has been reduced or removed or so. I assume it's still going to be there in this case for, for adding liquidity and so forth. Okay. And then there's also the fees and stuff like that, the fees coming out. I'm not exactly sure if the fees are going to be set aside or if the fees are going to sit inside a singleton contract. That's a good question as well. Okay. So the next feature we have are these hooks. Now this is the big one. This is the big change. Okay. Now hooks are pretty interesting. They're, they, 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 I, I heard someone call it instead of building on top, it's building underneath. So we have this idea in DeFi of, uh, projects are de deployed and then other projects build on top of that, 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 that foundation or that system. And what someone has, has kind of described this as I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, but as building underneath the foundation. So that's, that's very interesting. So th there's a, some key things. I'm going to go through each, each of the little optionalities inside, inside the hooks and kind of explain it as I understand it. So the first thing we have to talk about is that a hook is a separate smart contract. Okay. So the Danny dev here is going to need to design and deploy his own hook contract. Okay. Now, this is important because these contracts could, can be upgradable, they can be changeable, they can be exploitable, they can be uh, ruggable, okay? So they, these contracts kind of increase the amount of risk of using Uniswap to some extent. You need, if you're going to interact with the pool that Danny Dev has created, you need to kind of make sure that his hook uh, is, is safe, okay? Now, Although I say it's upgradable, it is limited, okay? So it's not like they can change everything inside the Uniswap. They can only predefine some, like, some perimeters. But one thing I would say for sure is if you're going to interact with a pool, make sure that the hook is, like, you know, verified and you can read the code and stuff like that. It's not an unverified contract, okay? So let's talk about some of the features as I understand them. So the first one is before and after init, so initialization. So that's the creating of this pool. So I'm not exactly sure how this has worked, but I, what I can think of is is just kind of like before you create the pool, I want to you know set the settings of the fees and and, and stuff like this, and and create my situation for my pool. So you would either do that before the pool is is the, the transfer tokens are gone in and the pool is ready, or just after the pool has, the tokens have gone in. And and that they're inside. So this is kind of, in my mind, this is kind of like setting the settings, okay? <clears throat> now, some of the things that the settings can do are basically the next couple positions. Now this is like whenever someone calls modify position, which is kind of add or remove liquidity, okay? So think of it like that. So if, if Danny or somebody else has some of these liquidity pool tokens and they want to remove or add liquidity, then this hook contract has the ability to perform like maybe a fee on it. I'm going to call it a tax, but uh, just so you understand. So there is a taxation, perhaps, perhaps this hook contract might has the ability to, to implement a tax on removing liquidity or adding liquidity. So if you remove liquidity, then that tax is going to be taken out assuming that it does that and is put into the hook, okay? And the hook has to predefine what that tax will do. So this is something you you need to look at if you're going to deal with it. If you're going to add liquidity to Caesar ETH, right? You need to understand does the ta how does this taxation work if that happens to be there. So the taxation, let's say he's removing some liquidity, uh, the taxation kicks in, it takes some of it, and it puts it inside this hook contract to be used, how this hook contract defines that it's going to use that. And it could be something very simple, like just allow Danny Dev to take it, right? <clears throat> or send it to anyone, okay? Send it as a charity or, or all kinds of things, okay? So the next thing is before or after the swap, okay? So they can create some sort of like a change before or after the swap has happened. Now, an example of this would be to uh, to change the fee structure, okay? So instead, so maybe they will tax the fees, so increase the fees, okay? So if the fee is set uh, in the pool to, I don't know, 0.01%, and then maybe they want to add another 0.1%, so 0.2%, and that 0.2% is sent again to this uh, hook contract to deal with as defined. Now, another idea is maybe they can 
you know, up the fees or down the fees based on some dynamic idea. Now, my idea is perhaps the fees as this pool gets more out of out of uh, out of uh, balance, then the fees increase. Or as the liquidity of this pool goes down, the fees increase or something like that. And you can think it can also do the same thing with this add and remove liquidity. Maybe the the removing of liquidity can be dynamic as well, the, the tax. So if if you're removing liquidity and you're taking it below some threshold, you pay more tax than if you're just if you're if the if the pool is quite healthy. So all of these kind of ideas can be implemented. Now they, they need to be built. They're not here already. Someone needs to come up with this idea, test it, build it, and implement it in a hook contract. Okay. Now the last thing is this donate function. Now when people see this donate function, they're thinking, oh God, you know, donate, donate to who, right? Now I, the way I'm thinking about it is this contract can use the donate function to donate its money back into here. So what they had to make a function inside the Uniswap version 4 that allows people to donate to LPs so that this contract can send the money it's collecting to this. Now donate does only give like the, the tokens to the people who are currently in range so inside the prices within your set range and it has to be a token of the LP you can't send shitcoin into the Caesar ETH LP using the donate function okay so this is this is this is important I think you know I, I think of this as as probably the most key feature of, of, of all of these hooks is the ability for these hook contracts to pay the LPs that are in range in the tokens that there are. So it's, it's normally the fees are set aside, but it is their fees. It is their fee, like uh, the LPs fees, but now it allows this hook to give those fees directly back to these people. Now I do have the question is, is it given back to them and added to their liquidity? Are there, is their liquidity deeper? Is it active liquidity or is it set inside this bank as fees and so forth? This I don't know, okay? Now the last thing uh, that they mention inside uh, the, the white paper that has some sort of like relevance that I think is worthy of talking about is the idea of this time-weighted average price, okay? Or this time-weighted uh, average market maker. So people sometimes ask me, what, what is this? So the way I like to think about it is laddering, automatic laddering in or out, okay? So let's say a dollar a boosted bill has a whole bunch of ETH. Let's say he's got thousands and thousands of ETH and he wants to buy this Caesar token and he wants to spend, you know, 200 ETH on Caesar token. If he just does that, bam, then he's going to print this huge red candle. He's going to lose a whole bunch to slippage and price impact and, uh, or sorry, not red candle, green candle, right? <clears throat> and then he's going, you know, it's going to change things. But if he want the other option is he can come every day with a little bit and buy and buy and buy and buy okay so what this does instead is it maybe allows him to set a price right oh so I within this time weighted price I want to keep buying okay so then he will buy 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 over time right over the time waiting so as time progresses he will continually buy 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 and that way it has a lot less impact on the price at that instant of, of, of buying, okay? So that pretty much covers uh, my understanding of uh, this Uniswap version 4 so far. Um, I will uh, re uh, echo the idea that these smart contracts, these hook contracts are the key thing about this. And there, this is open to like very much a lot of creativity and innovation. So this video kind of explains how things work, but all of these hooks are going to require your own research and your own dig, dig, like due diligence in order to make sure that you understand what these hooks are going to do with these these features that they can they can interact with. Okay, uh, I hope this has been useful and interesting, and I appreciate you for watching. And thank you, and goodbye.